before I start, when I say in, then please say out. In. Out. In. Out. In. Out. Okay. So I always start because I started off as an artist. And so therefore the artistry is the important part of me that makes me feel more comfortable. The academic side is the side that um, I always feel, you know, the imposter syndrome. Because really I feel like I, I should never have been here. I was telling Brother Kenny yesterday, I want to thank him and thank all the team for inviting me here and putting me in this space. I've, I've delivered a lecture in um, Oxford before, and now I'm in Cambridge. <laughs> and so all of this goes against where I started. Because when I was growing up, I never thought I would live beyond 21. So I had no plans for um, beyond 21. I thought maybe I'll die some kind of violent death, because that is what was happening on the streets around me. I grew up in that age where skinheads and, and they were running you down with bottles and, and, and knives and things because we didn't belong. And then I looked at many of the youths that I grew up with in school and some of them have gone on to do different things but many of them have gone to prison as well. And I remember growing up as a youth, one of the things that, um, that I was affected by was my head teacher in primary school who used to come to the black children, knock us on our head and say, you're a numbskull, repeat after me, what are you? And we used to have to say, I'm a numbskull. But in the back of my head, I would say, not me, really, then I'm going to show. <laughs> and that's why I'm here today. But that is why many others are not and are absent. And so, today, when I came, I thought, what shall I wear? Because, you know, as Michael was saying, how you present yourself is very important. And especially coming from the family I came from, where my mother used to say, two type of people in this world. There's the good-looking people who can wear anything they like because <laughs> their face will carry them out. <laughs> and there's the ones that are not so good-looking. <laughs> And those people have to work on their charm and always be presentable so that you give people something to look at. So, as you can imagine, she said to us, oh, no, I have to work on another charm. <laughs> so, that is, that is what I thought about. What should I wear? And then I was going to, I said, let me wear one of my African shirts. Out. Then I said, no. Let me keep it simple, I'm going to wear black. Because black, in this country, people understand it as mourning. And so I'm going to mourn with all of those who have gone to join the ancestors, who didn't make it here. But also, for us, black is a, an important thing too. Because black fit everything. <laughs> and so, in terms of when I look around and see Everybody, how people are dressed and things. I look at the beautiful blue in front of me, sparkling. You see, all of this is part of who we are and how we present ourselves and how we resist against the invisibility that is enforced on us very often. And so, this wasn't part of my presentation, but, you know, I, I just thought I'd share something with you to get us started. So I'm going to start now. I'm looking at dance as multiple identities. It's the reggae dance hall culture, the dance movement, and visibility. Okay? So we're looking at reggae dance hall and what it says. Because reggae dance hall, particularly in this country, and in Jamaica where it came from originally, reggae dance hall is seen as the... Um, the, the bad boy or the bad girl in comparison to other forms. And so I want to go against that. So, um, Caroline Cooper says, Africans taken away without tools were able to rebuild material culture from the blueprint of knowledge carried in our collective heads. And so 
Um, I thought it would be poignant to start with that quote and, and have that in our, in our minds because the development of um, dancehall culture in Britain and reggae dancehall, when I talk about reggae dancehall, I'm talking about the, um, the musical form, I'm talking about the space that takes us right back from, from, um, from the Caribbean, from the UK through the Caribbean, right back to Africa. When I talk about dancehall itself, then I'm talking about the distinct form that developed from the 1970s onwards. So, the record dancehall space inherently presents the many contradictions and tensions existing within the lived experience of black African Caribbean bodies performing within Britain. Through dance vocabulary, incorporating sound system music culture, language, fashion, visual and stylistic trends, I argue that black bodies within the reggae dance hall space represents or represents embodied forms of resistance against a psychology of racism that makes them invisible on one hand, whilst harvesting and commoditizing the cultural expression they produce on the other. So really, it's like what Michael said, said before. Um, people want, want the culture, but they don't want to see us. Uh, if they can take the culture and others can perform it for them, that is the best, the best um, scenario for them. Okay? So, I therefore explore the creation of... Um, sorry. I therefore explore the creation of black countercultural spaces, as... Um, Robert Beckford speaks about, such as the blues and house parties, church and school halls, clubs, and various temporary entertainment venues. You know the kind of venues we used to go to, going down into the basement for a blues party one night, going, going to a school hall another, wedding keeping, going to the church hall um, for the reception another time. These are the countercultural spaces that we, we um, developed in order to be able to practice the cultural expression which is part of our survival mechanism and is part of the resistance against um, the, the, cultural, the cultural drought that was trying to be imposed on us. Okay, so today I wish to focus on a number of things. So I'm going to focus on the creation and negotiation of reggae dance hall spaces. I'll then talk about the corporeal dancing body. I'll explain that in, in, a, in a moment in more detail. I'll then talk about dance within sound system dance sessions. And then the reggae dance hall as a signifier of religious cosmology, symbolic gestures, movements, and values. And then finally, hopefully there'll be enough time, um, black bodies themselves as countercultural spaces. Okay, so, um, really, I could start with myself, because I was con conceived in Jamaica, but born 20 days after my mother reached here, and I never forgive her for that. <laughs> <laughs> I always say, she should have had me first and then come. And she always said, well, it's a good thing she didn't because life might have been a little different for me had she done that. But still, I would have liked that experience. So um, through that um, and uh, growing up within a Jamaican community in Birmingham, I experienced um, what Carlin Cooper speaks of above through um, so the material culture that Caroline Cooper speaks of, through sound system culture, particularly when you go to the Lover's Rock, the dub, and the reggae dance hall sessions. Okay? So, oppression has been inscribed upon black people's bodies, beginning with shuttle enslavement and the transatlantic slave trade, through colonialism, and it continued with the migration of, um, of African Car Caribbean people to Britain. 
the recent 2018 um, Windrush scandal um, demonstrate Britain's deep-rooted structural racism and black dan dancing bodies have been instrumental in resisting the hostility black people have endured within British society. Um, okay, so, sorry, I know Michael has shown this already, and I did think, oh, will I have enough time to find another picture and put there? Then I said, no, let me put this one, because I'm going to, I'm going to show you why the connection. This picture is quite well known. A lot of books and things will show this picture in terms of, of um, the, the Windrush generation and the dancing within the space. And so plenty of people know it. What plenty of people don't know about this picture, because it demonstrates the dance that was happening within the blue space, within, within the, um, the, the dance, dance hall sessions and things. But you see the sister on the end there, she was part of a group called Lanzel. And so when you see her there, she's dancing and skanking away. But as she's dancing and skanking away, in her head at any, any moment, she had the African vocab. So you have da dum dum da da dum da da dum 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 da 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 so she can be skanking away and she knows that she has the vocabulary for if there's an attack, the Becca war dance. She knows how to advance, turn, dodge the bullet one way, dodge the bullet the other way. And this is part of the dance that we brought into the dance hall space. Okay? Right. Dance exists within most human societies as a mode of communication. It facilitates spiritual, cultural, and individual expression, as well as the negotiation of identity, sexuality, gender, hierarchy, personhood, and profile. So in fact, what, what I'm saying is that dance facilitates all aspects of our lives, okay? And dance also involves bodies connecting, expressing pleasure dynamically, sensuality, or an intimate contact with each other. Crucially, dance enables individuals to move in a way that embodies the symbols and codes important and recognizable within their particular culture and experience. For example, African Caribbean dance demands strength, stamina and emotion as reflected when you're in the dance hall space and the bouncing, stepping out, stepping together. Can we just do the dance hall reggae bounce? <laughs> Everybody, just stand up where you are. Please. So, you might say, where does strength and the stamina come in? But I can see some people sat, sat down and said, cool, yeah. <laughs> So you imagine when the dance starts at 8 o'clock at night and some people who might not know the culture will arrive at 8. <laughs> not knowing that the rest of us not coming till uh, midnight, 1 o'clock. But when you dance from midnight, 1 o'clock, right through to 8 o'clock in the morning, that's where the stamina comes in. You see, some people, when they dance and they can't take it anymore, <laughs> you see some of them lean up and they <laughs> And before you know it, the stamina and the strength comes in again because you see them there and you don't realize they drop asleep and then it's <laughs> <laughs> So, stamina and strength is an important part. And then, um, Historically, <laughs> dance and music are employed by African and New African, meaning New African people, as a survival mechanism and a means of communicating, celebrating the birth to death life cycle events, recording important stories and mythologies, remembering and memorializing historic events, individuals, 
and locations, and crucially, honoring the ancestors. The supreme, the supreme being, okay, thank you. The supreme being, as you can see, we're behind, so I'm gonna have to um, jump ahead. So we have the supreme being, which is God Almighty, as African scholars conquer. So the corporeal dancing body is the body taken over and subsumed by dance. It's the music and the spirit, the undulating and pulsating to the rhythm, the, the radiating <coughs> movement through every bone, every muscle, and every organ and cell, injecting a dynamic life and energy beyond the boundary of the skin surface into the atmosphere. So what it's really saying is that when you go to a dance hall session, what you see there and what you feel, you don't just hear the music, you feel the music vibrating through the body, but it goes through every cell because when they start to dance, you go into a space and the vocal dance, dance is being done, you feel an energy within the space as everybody, can we all stand one moment again? <laughs> okay, thank you. So, um, the, the corporal dancing body, therefore, is part of the resistance, okay? All right, so um, the corporal dancing body is a term that I use where it incorporates um, Thomas Fuchs's notion of the lived body, which is a body that, that, um, that is just kinesthetic movement. So if I make a circle, this doesn't mean anything, it's just a circle. This doesn't mean anything, it's a circle. But then when we add the corporeal body to it, the part that puts um, emotion and actually puts meaning to it, when I do this, it's now beckoning. So I can beckon this way. When I rub my foot on the ground and circle this way, it becomes nolinga, 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 nolinga. You see, nolinga movement. If we're in the spiritual space, that same circling, circling here and here, we're trapping the spirit. We're bringing the spirit in with the yang balu. And so you can see the connection between yang balu and nolinga. Okay? So it means that within the dance hall space, we have the symbols, the signs and the symbols, and a, and a sign is anything that conveys meaning. It, it signifies to something else. So you have a sign, you have a signifier, which is a notion, and then you have the concept that is signified. So if I put a drawing on, on, on the wall and it looks like a woman, you get the idea of a woman. But that's not the real woman, because the real woman is the woman we see in flesh who can move around. But that becomes the sign that signifies the idea of the woman, which we see the physical woman in front of us. Okay, and so within the dance hall space, what we're doing, we're connecting and, and connecting and signifying back to some of the African, neo-African practices and the ancestral connections that those um, practices enable us to make. But we're making it within the dance hall space. So that in itself, becomes part of the resistance that we have adopted in terms of enabling our culture to continue in its own way, masked within the dance itself. And this is something then, if we put it in books, we have to wait, as people have been saying um, over the last, last two days, we have to wait for people to go and read. We're telling them to read. Um, Professor Glenn, Martin Glenn, he was telling people, go and read. But if we start to read the body, it means that the information is there in front of us each and every day. And when we go to the dance hall space, we are going to the place where we can begin to read. 
and going to the place where we will begin to comprehend the communication that we are making within with each other. So I'm going to um, have to sign off, but to, to know that within this space, we have had many, many um, generations that have gone through the notion of no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. So we felt that rejection. We've developed the Blues Party as a countercultural space, the space in which we can be together, we can commune, and we can connect. And when we connect with each other, when we're dancing, you know, as soon as the bodies lock together and start to whine, whether it's around the world, or through the figure of eight, or if it's just the half twist with the dip. And the dip sometimes, you see some people, they dip, and they stop, can't come up, they have to go and pull up back again. When, when you're witnessing that, some people say, oh, Ooh. this is lewd and crude. No, it is individuals connecting together yeah. in resistance to the fact that we are portrayed, as um, Levi said earlier on, we're portrayed as not having families. Oh, sorry, I think um, Michael said it as a, we're portrayed as not having families. Look on the TV casualty or whatever, it's always the black character who doesn't have a black backstory. They're only at work all the time. But, but within the dance hall space, through the connection, we see that we, we are not aggressive and we are not angry black people. We have intimacy. We have connection. And we have communication. So, thank you. I'm getting <laughs>